Is water the key to our health? And do we really understand the water inside of our bodies? Stay tuned to this episode to find out more. Welcome back, my friends. My name is Sarah. I am known as Carnivore Yogi. Thank you so much for being here and clicking on today's video. Today we have a real treat. We have Dr. Gerald Pollock, who is really the father of all of this water science that I've been talking about here on the show with you for several episodes. So we have done a ton of episodes on water, particularly this molecular water, the water inside of our cells, our cellular water. And I really just wanted to go straight to the source. So Dr. Gerald Pollock is an author, he's a scientist, just an amazing person who was very generous with his time to sit down and chat with me today. I also wanna mention that his lab is in danger of being shut down. A lot of the information and the science coming out of his lab is considered controversial. We do talk about that, but his lab is in danger of being shut down. So if you would like to make a donation to his lab, I'm gonna put that down in the show notes for you. If you're in a position to make a sizable donation, I have been given Dr. Pollock's email address. He says, please have them reach out to him and speak with him because we really want this science. We really want this information to continue. So, so important. So please do, if you can contribute a little bit, please do. And I wanna thank very quickly before we jump into today's episode, a couple of sponsors. There are a ton of timestamps that give a lot of detail where you can just jump through this episode, go back, listen to other parts of it. Those timestamps are made possible by my sponsors. The first one is gonna be Viva Rays. These are their three-in-one clip and go system. Blue blockers are extremely important when we talk about protecting that cellular water inside of our bodies. When we're under a lot of artificial lights, it's going to actually dehydrate the cells in our body. We will talk about that in this episode. Viva Rays has an awesome system. So you have a screen lens, you have a after sunset lens and a before bed lens that you can use very easily in this one system. You can use my code Yogi to save 15% over at Viva Rays. Again, it will help you with your cellular hydration, believe it or not. So thank you again to Viva Rays for sponsoring today's episode. The second sponsor of today's episode is Optimal Carnivore. You can use my code carnivore uppercase Y to save 10% on their organ meat complex. Excellent, excellent way to fill in nutritional gaps. Have been using it prenatally, will be using it postnatally. Just a fantastic all natural way, again, to get those nutrients into your diet. So thank you for those two sponsors and let's go ahead, get into today's episode. All right. Welcome back, everyone. I'm so excited to have today's guest on the show. We've been doing so many episodes on water, understanding water, and this is just really a a special treat to have you here. Uh, Dr. Gerald Pollack, I consider you the father of, of, of structured water, all things water. So thank you so much for being here. Well, it's my pleasure. I'm so happy to um, to join you, uh, Sarah, and looking forward to our discussion. Uh, yeah. Yes, it, it's. Uh, I've been listening to interviews of, of yours all day, and of course, I have your lovely book here, and with all these beautiful illustrations, I recommend anyone go out and buy it. And I know you have a couple more things coming out, so we have a lot of great things to chat about. Oh, and the illustrations, by the way, that you mentioned were done by my son and I'm, oh. I'm really proud of him. He he started drawing at age four and he studied art. He's a professional artist. And one day he said, dad, I would like to illustrate your next book. And uh, there have been so many positive comments about his yes. illustrations. Um, and, um, and now uh, finally um, his home remodel is just about finished and he's returning. Uh, to finish the illustrations that he began on two forthcoming books. So excited about that. (laughs) That's very exciting. And the illustrations make what you have to say, which is just so fascinating, kind of make it all come to life. So that that's, it's really, really neat to hear that. That's your son. Thank you. I I will relay those comments to him. (laughs) (laughs) Wonderful. Well, I, I, there's so many things that I have uh, so many notes here, but I would love to kind of talk to you a little bit about, um, you know, how we focus so much on ATP as our, 
primary energy source. And the more I dive into your work and, 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 and follow the things that you do, I'm starting to think that water is, is the, the, the byproduct of the mitochondria that's even more important. Um, I'd love to hear your take on that and, and kind of how that works. Well, yeah. Um, so it, it really starts with, with um, um, a, a physical uh, chemical group 70 or 80 years ago i can't i can't remember and uh, and they deduced that but you know everybody was concerned at the time where, where do where does our energy come from mm -hmm. and nobody knew and they said we found it um it's it's in the high energy bond uh phosphate uh, bond and a atp has has one such bond and they published it and the world uh, was excited about about this revelation because everybody wanted to know, you know, how do we get our energy? We take in food, and somehow the food is converted to energy. So how how does this work? A year later, another group, um, prominent group, uh, published a paper suggesting that these guys were wrong, that they made a simple arithmetic error, and. Um, you know, I was alerted uh, to 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 this problem by one Gilbert Ling, who who spent the late Gilbert Ling, who who passed at age 100 a couple of years ago. He spent his whole life dealing with biological water, which he argued was different from, uh, say, um, um, uh, th this kind of water in, in the glass. He said the molecules in this case were ordered, you see, and and the order uh, uh, was diff is completely different from uh, it's more like a like a, a, a crystal anyway in his website gilbertling.org i think it's still uh, available despite his passing um he alerted the world to uh, to this controversy but it wasn't really a controversy because nobody had taken it up has taken it up so there are two points of view and one one point of view is that our energy comes from the from the the high energy phosphate bond and another point of view is that's nonsense uh, it's the result of an arithmetic error and oddly uh, or maybe not so oddly nobody has taken up the challenge and nobody has followed so so really um um, although almost nobody thinks that there's a controversy, there really is a controversy. It's just mm -hmm. that nobody has taken it up. And we don't know. Is it really true that our energy comes from that um, high energy phosphate bond or not? Right. And so um, another option uh, has has come up with, with our discovery of, of the fourth phase or easy, we, we call it sometimes, uh, water. And, and that water contains energy. And I can explain, uh, if you ask me, uh, yes. how, how, do, how does it contain energy? Why, why does it contain energy? But I will tell you that it contains energy. It contains huge amounts of energy. So, and we've got, our body is filled with this kind of water. And so question arises, uh, to what extent does this energy power um, our lives and um, our our functions, and the answer is unknown. Uh, it could be zero, or it could be a hundred percent, or it could be somewhere in between. Uh, this remains to be seen, but the potential is definitely there. And you know, this um, this brings to mind the so-called breatharians, the people mm. who who don't eat. And so, of course, they don't eat. Where do they get their energy? <laughs> because, you know, to do work always requires energy. And these people do work just the same way that we do work. You know, we walk up the stairs. That's work. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And it needs energy. So where does the energy come from? Is it is it really from the high energy bond of ATP? Or, or does it come somehow from the energy contained in easy water? So I, you know, I'm not answering the question because I don't know the answer, but it's it's a question that absolutely needs to be addressed. So thank you for asking. I agree. And, you know, the thing that I've talked about with several of my guests is that our, everyone always says, oh, your body is, you know, 65, 70% water, but it's actually 99% water molecule. And so when we think about the body kind of in that way, 
how could we not derive energy or how could water inside the body not play a huge role in our the functions of our body our energy all of those things it just to me doesn't make sense when you look at it in, in that way well i agree with you uh, you know this this figure of 99 percent sometimes gets misinterpreted just just to be clear you i mean you're absolutely right but so the idea is that um you're you're roughly two-thirds water by volume right right but if you line up all the molecules in the cell and start counting one by one, you'll find that more than 99% of them are, are water molecules. Because in order to fill that two thirds volume, you need a lot of these tiny water molecules. So if you do the count, you, it turns out, and other people have done the count, that it's more than 99% of your molecules. And if you think philosophically, you know, how is it possible that um, 99% percent of your molecules don't do anything and the current view if you you know if you read a mm -hmm. textbook on cell biology or biochemistry or physiology if they still exist you'll find that um, the the point of view that's expressed is that the water molecules or the water simply bathes the more important molecules of life uh, water doesn't really do anything it's, it's just a solvent for the important molecules and, um, you know, given the fact that nine, more than 99 out of 100 of your molecules are water, it seems somewhat arrogant to, to make that presumption that, oh, yeah, well, it, it, water doesn't really do anything. But water does a lot. And um, in, um, I've written a couple of books um, on, on the subject. And the first book, 2001, um, Cells, Gels, and the Engines of Life, deals with the role of water, especially the role of this so-called structured water, we mm -hmm. now call it easy or fourth phase water, which exists throughout all the cells in your body. And, and the evidence uh, adduced from many, many studies uh, is really clear and, and, and the, that the water, in fact, plays an integral role in virtually everything the body does. Uh, the water undergoes a a transition, a so-called phase transition. Uh, it goes from the structure, when, when, when the cell is activated, for example, when a muscle cell, it's in the, when it, it starts in the relaxed condition. And in, the, in that condition, the, the water is actually organized or structured uh, the way Gilbert Ling uh, suggested and the way we've subsequent, with, subsequently deduced, which is a bit different from uh, what Gilbert Ling found, but, but thematically similar. That water, when the muscle transitions uh, from relaxed to contracted, the water and the proteins also transition. And, and that's what creates the contraction, but it's not just the proteins that do it, it's the water. And then when the muscle relaxes again, the water returns to its structured state. So the water plays a central role. The water goes from, um, from structured, fourth phase, easy water to ordinary liquid water, and then back again. Uh, it's, and, and so it, it's the crux of what happens inside the cell. Although, <coughs> although you, won't, you won't find that in the textbooks. No. So it's completely different. But, you know, <coughs> excuse me, if you take a look at the evidence, the evidence compels. If you read the textbook, you'll get a different story. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and I feel like the a lot of the research I've read around this has just come directly out of your lab. It, it And it seems like it's a little controversial uh, in in most, you know, modern science, would you say? I would. Yeah, yeah. I, of course, it's controversial. But I say, but, you know, it, it the but harkens back to um, one of the more famous uh, quotes of Albert St. Georgie, uh, who, you know, many consider to be the father of modern biochemistry. And um, he won a Nobel Prize for discovering vitamin C. And he went on to, um, uh, to, to, to put to make his mark in so many different fields. And, and one of his more famous comments is, the only time I knew I was on to something really important is when the reactions were polarized, when some people thought it was a wonderful idea and other people thought
thought it was complete nonsense. Then he knew he was on to something and because nobody would comment, nobody would make negative comments if, if the issue were not uh, plausible and perhaps even right. And, and then, you know, it, it's, um, it's human nature. We, we like to cling to our, our belief systems. It's almost like religion, you know, mm -hmm. cling, especially, especially if our careers are, um, are made based on, 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 on the prevailing ideas and concepts. We don't like to give that up. It's just human nature. So, yeah. Um, um, and 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 in the in the, in the case of water, there's a tradition of of challenge, a tradition that goes way back, um, uh, way back to, for example, Boris Deryagin, and and Deryagin was perhaps the most famous Russian physical chemist. Um, and this was about 50 years ago um, uh, in, in his laboratory, they discovered some unusual properties of, of liquid water. And it gradually became known as so-called poly water because the water mm. seemed to behave, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> as though it were a, pol a polymer. Mm. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Oh, have some water. <laughs> uh, I will have some water. I need. I don't drink enough of this. <laughs> I've heard you say that on other interviews before. I'm like, that's ironic. <laughs> well, it is, but you know how it goes. <laughs> I do. I do. <laughs> yeah, I need to drink, drink more. So, um, yeah. So, uh, uh, Deryagin um, um, was basically discredited because he found. He found some kind of water uh, whose physical properties were absolutely distinct from ordinary liquid mm -hmm. water. The, the boiling temperature uh, was higher, the freezing temperature was lower, the density was higher, and it, all, all the properties uh, uh, differed. And, and um, it received a lot of criticism after it, it, it appeared um, in international journals. And of course it did. And, um, and 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 the story, as the story goes, one uh, I think it was an Australian group. Um, what they did was uh, they they re repeated the experiments and um, and they put salt in the water, mm -hmm. and they found properties that were not too different. And they said, well, you know, the Russians must have been sweating into their water to produce <laughs> that that result, you know, and that. <laughs> That that really did it. Um, the whole world was convinced that the Russian finding of poly water from the most distinguished physical chemist, uh, perhaps in the world, uh, was erroneous. And then um, uh, he wrote a paper, uh, Deryagin himself, two or three years ago, saying that the critics are right. Now, so, <laughs> however, really? well, he did. Yeah, he did. However. There's a backstory to this, and I found out the backstory uh, by speaking with with two people. One is his one of his last postdocs before he died, who has become a you know well known scientist, and also the director of a um, an institute in Puccino, which is the Science City, who knew him intimately. They lived in the same apartment building, and uh, they shared coffee and vodka three times a week. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And they independently they told me the same story. Until the day he died, he was sure, absolutely sure that he was right. And the reason why why did he write this um, retraction, uh, which basically sealed the coffin of mm. poly water? He wrote it because he was pressured by the government to do it. You know, the uh. Soviet Soviet government uh, wanted to avoid any kind of embarrassment. At, you know, one of their most distinguished scientists. Um, screwed up. He made an error, and it was easier for them if this guy admitted that he made an error. Otherwise, see that way the error is is attributed to one scientist rather than to the whole Soviet regime, which would have been very embarrassing. So they said the same thing, and um, he was sure he was right. And you know, it may be that he was right. And I, I illustrate that. Um, I, I I mentioned that because because it's very common that mm -hmm. uh, when when there's a revolutionary finding of 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 any sort, of any kind, yeah, you you get a response. You always get a response, and so um, 
um, you know, one has to then uh, judge. So, so indeed, what what we found has been, you might say, controversial, and it's controversial. It's not controversial in 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 some areas. Uh, people people in in different fields, uh, for example, in health, but there are many other fields, have have taken up these findings and 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 taken them very seriously. And mm -hmm. new insights have arisen. On the other hand, um, there have been roughly a half dozen papers, uh, uh, mostly from chemists, who um, who say, oh, no, it's, it's, it's got to be wrong. And I did write a rebuttal to the first one, and I I, um, I just don't find the time to, um, yeah. and, and motivation to, to write rebuttals to all the others that have appeared, which, which follow more or less the same um, uh, thematic arguments as, as, as the first one. Um, you know, I've I've read the, these and I've digested them, and you know, I I I must admit, I I, I think they're off track. But yep. you know, every, everybody's entitled to their opinion. Definitely, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> absolutely. And one of the things that I mean, there's a lot of things that have come out of your lab that have been quote unquote controversial. But one of the things that I get the most pushback on when I talk about it on my platform um, is this whole idea that when we expose our body to non-native EMF, um, it depletes our easy water, you know, 15 to 20%. That's, that's something, that's a real, that's, that's a real finding from your lab, correct? Well, I don't know where the 15 to 20% comes from, but um, it might come from experiments that we did, we've not published yet. Um, uh, we put, um, uh, Wi-Fi, um, we, we considered the effect of Wi-Fi and water, yes. and we did some experiments, and we put a router um, right near a chamber in which we 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 had easy, uh, nicely exposed and easy to measure. And when we turned on the router, um, and, and the easy size did diminish by, well, roughly the amount that you that you mentioned. So this is this is one experiment. It's not published yet. Um, and uh, I, I, it's a, you might call it preliminary because we we haven't really done thorough studies, but it, it does indicate that there there may indeed be some some impact um, of electromagnetic energy. Uh, there there's a lot in 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 the literature on uh, on this. There's a, a book that you're probably familiar with, uh, the Invisible Rainbow. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, and that book. That book is is absolutely worth reading, and evidence is presented over the past hundred years demonstrating, in, really interestingly, that when when some new advance occurred in, in electrical communication, inevitably it was followed by a pandemic, which then uh, diminished yeah. um, in, in intensity over the next few years and. And and you know we're experiencing something like that right now. We and are. What's, what's new right now? Well, relatively new is <laughs> is um, Wi-Fi and especially five G. Five G. And there's been a lot of talk about five G and and the hazards associated with it. Um, well, yeah. So yeah. so it is entirely possible that some of the frequencies that are involved um, with with the uh, electromagnetic um, issues and communication do have negative effects and you know for that reason I got to tell you I've avoided having a cell phone I, I, I think I'm one of the few on, on the surface of the earth without really <laughs> no cell phone no cell phone wow. uh, and, uh, I'm I'm capitulating soon I, I think because it's getting to be impossible to live without a phone you know, uh, I'm sure <laughs> I, an appointment with my optometrist. They said, what you need to do is you sit, sit in the car in the parking lot and text us when you arrive. And then we'll text you back again when it's time to come in. Well, I have no cell phone. I can't text. Does that mean I can't get an appointment? <laughs> so it's, wow. it's, it's that sort of thing that make, makes it it makes it cumbersome so I'm i might sure. i might need need to capitulate on that <laughs> well that says a lot if if you're trying, you know you know what you know you've done the research that you have and the work that you have and you don't want to get a cell phone that i mean that's very symbolic in my opinion <laughs> 
well, I, maybe it's symbolic. It, it's also that, you know, I tend to be overconnected. People write me an email, mm. I respond. I, it's hard for me to not respond. And, you know, if um, if I have a cell phone as well, it, it's going to be, oh, it's still be twice, <laughs> <laughs> twice yeah. the number of responses. And I will have no time for anything. Not even yeah. <laughs> I know there's a there's a certain amount of discipline you have to have with the phones for sure because uh, I fall into that trap myself quite often well perhaps you can teach me the discipline <laughs> it's I'm not very good at it <laughs> oh, okay <laughs> I'm hoping with the new baby it'll be a little easier just focus on on him and put the phone in another room I usually have to just literally put it in another room or another area of the house so that it, I have to make a big effort to go and get it. Otherwise, it just is a huge distraction. So well, thank you for your suggestion. I may do the same. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm not yeah. having a baby, although sometimes <laughs> when I look at my profile, it might look that way. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you can also turn 5G off of your phone, too. I've figured out how to, I don't know if you can do it on the new models, but I have a, yeah, a well, phone where yeah. you, can turn, you can disable it, but it's, you're still getting, you're, you know, you're still getting, you're still the, getting radiation. radiation. The yeah, sure. you are. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So you guys have studied a lot about how, uh, I guess, electromagnetic fields though, that they do affect water. Um, because I, I get a lot of questions about people who want to structure their water. You know, there's so many different devices and I've had people say, oh, can I just put water in a blender or can I put it through this uh, electric machine? And I'm like, something tells me that's probably not a good idea. It would probably create some pretty discoherent water. Um, what are your thoughts on that sort of thing? Well, well you know, as a rule, we, we don't, there are so many uh, companies now that uh, mm -hmm. commercially say, well, you know, our water contains um, a lot of structured water or mm -hmm. easy water or fourth phase water. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they ask us to, um, to test the water. And I uh, absolutely um, avoid doing that. And, and the reason is um, I don't want to, to be in, in a, uh, a position where it seems that I'm endorsing a particular type of water. I, I, I feel it's really important for us to remain independent of any commercial enterprise in, in order for our fundamental studies to be taken seriously. Otherwise, you, you know, you begin to get labeled as um, some guy who's hawking a particular mm -hmm. kind of water and, and they're paying you for it and you're, you're doing this to, uh, to get money and such. And, uh, so, and, and so as a consequence, because we haven't studied it, um, any of these, and if we were to study it, we'd have no time left to do anything else. Right. <laughs> you know, and, and what, what really moves me is, is to study the fundamentals of science, even beyond water, but water is, is certainly at, at, at the center. So, so there's a long introduction to, um, to a, a short response, and the response is, I don't know. Yeah. Sure. Um, I, I like that any, answer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm we sorry do. If that disappoints huh? I'm sorry if that disappoints, but um, no, I appreciate it. Yeah. I I love when when people can just say, "Hey, <laughs> we're st we're still figuring it out." You know, uh, I think people really sometimes want these definite answers. And water, the more that I study it, the more I feel just like, "Gosh, I really don't know anything." <laughs> the more I try to learn about it, I'm like, "Wow, there's I know maybe like this much." And yeah, it's such a complicated topic. It can be complicated, but you know, um, nature nature is actually, in the long run, really simple. At least, mm -hmm. at least I've I've come to to that conclusion. And um, you know, and if if you've got if you got the right answer, um, it, it 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 should be it should come come through. And for me, it's not simple. Although I must I must admit, uh, the book, the latest book that I wrote, the fourth phase of water. Which is very popular and translated mm -hmm. to like ten languages. Um, um, one of the smartest guys I know who's a, a Russian, who's a professor at uh, Moscow University, and who in fact edited the Russian translation. Of mine, he said every time he reads the book, um, which is at least three times, he gets a lot of new information. And mm -hmm. if this really smart guy 
needs to read the book multiple times to get it, then it must not be simple. <laughs> no. really, it's simple. I think it's simple, but uh, uh, other people may may find otherwise. Uh, you know, the paradigm, the central paradigm for me is 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 um, well, I, I hesitate to, to use the word uh, simple again and again, but it seems straightforward to me. Um, you know, you you start start with any kind of um, or most kinds, I should say, of hydrophilic water loving surfaces, and then the water meets the surface, and the molecules that are adjacent to the surface undergo a transition from ordinary liquid water to fourth phase water, and it, it's a it's a radical change. And then this sheet-like layer nucleates the next uh, layer, which nucleates the next layer. And so, so each layer forms out of, out of the ordinary liquid water, it transitions into EZ water. So it, it builds layer by layer, and we can track these layers as, as they build. And um, just a couple of features for those uh, who, who are not familiar, um, it turns out that this easy water typically is not neutral. So your water is mm -hmm. neutral, but it has negative charge. And the region beyond has an equal amount of positive charge, see, because you, you need to have a balance between the two because you're starting with liquid water, which is neutral. And if you have a zone of negative charge, you need to have another zone of positive charge. And that forms a battery. Um, mm -hmm. because you've got negative and positive. And, and we could demonstrate by sticking two electrodes in, one negative, one positive, we could demonstrate that you can actually get electrical uh, energy uh, from it, um, current flow, you see. And, and, and that means that, um, that um, th this kind of water uh, is a repository of energy. And, mm -hmm. and that's what I mentioned earlier in our discussion that this energy, because this water fills your body, um, it contains a lot of potential energy. And this energy um, might be, or logically, is going to be used in some way by the, by the body. And, and just another, another relevant point, uh, this is like a battery, but all batteries need charging. Yes. You need some energy to yes. build this potential energy. You, you need other energy to come in and do it. And, and we found... Um, to our surprise, this is, it was a finding of an undergraduate student who was doing what he was not supposed to do. Uh, he was shining a light on it. He noticed, he noticed where he was shining the light. The exclusion zone grew enormously, uh, a factor of three um, it, that when he was studying. And, and we did um, further experiments from that. I, when I saw it, I was, it was, I was flabbergasted because we'd been trying to figure out where does the energy come from to, to to build this charge and to separate uh, the charge, we couldn't figure it out. And the student, you know, um, I guess it was a blunder. He was just sort of fooling around with a gooseneck lamp that was sitting right next to the chamber, and and he did it. And so we started. We found that it, it was not visible light. It was not right. UV light. It was infrared light. The Thank you so much for listening to today's episode with Dr. Gerald Pollack. Such an absolute honor to have him here on the show. Just a quick little reminder, if you are in a position to donate, then check out his link. And then if you do want to make a sizable donation, please reach out to me and I will connect you directly with Dr. Pollack so that you can talk about that. We are in danger of losing a huge resource of science that is wanting to be suppressed. The science is not convenient, so we're gonna suppress it, right? It seems like a, a theme that's happening a lot these days. So thank you again for watching. If you are enjoying the episode, please leave me a comment, leave me a like, and share this video out with a friend, with a family member in a Facebook group or a group that you know where people are going to really appreciate this information. I also wanna thank very quickly one more sponsor of today's episode is gonna be Upgraded Formulas. They have a great magnesium product. However, I'm a bigger fan of their hair tissue mineral analysis with a consultation. 80% of us have a mineral deficiency, believe it or not. And just pouring in exogenous minerals sometimes is going to make this issue a million times worse. So a blood test is only gonna show you 
an acute or an emergency situation of what is going on inside of your body with your minerals. Getting a hair tissue mineral analysis is going to show you what's been going on over the last 60 to 90 days and getting a consultation, which I highly recommend because those tests can be very confusing to read, is going to actually guide you as to what you need to replace. If anything, you may be taking things like a magnesium, you may not be needing it. So check out that hair tissue mineral analysis with a consultation. Use my code YOGI12 or YOGI to save on either one of those. And thank you again. Let's jump back into this episode with Dr. Pollock. The long wavelengths that sometimes are um, uh, taken to be the same as heat. It's mm-hmm. not exactly the same, but but the two are, are closely related. Um, you know, infrared is actually the source and heating is the consequence. Um, uh, so we found, you know, if you, if you expose your, um, either your body or uh, mm-hmm. a vessel of uh, water with the right kind of surface immersed in the water, you'll get a buildup of easy. And the more infrared you have, the more easy you'll have. So it's, a, it's actually a pretty straightforward paradigm. And that's where the energy comes. So I, you know, without your asking, I've, I've outlined. I was going to, I was actually going there. So you read my mind <laughs> with okay, well, how I'm we build the easy user, water but... in the butter. Yeah, you did. <laughs> I'm glad it worked that way. <laughs> yeah. And when, so when we're outdoors, you know, I had a rough night, this, uh, this little baby in here had hiccups through the night. Oh, and wow. I think he was, I think he's going to be a soccer champion one day (laughs) (laughs) last night sleeping was very rough and so before oh you know it's it's part of the part of the course here (laughs) i'm great i'm grateful in the in the scheme of things to be in this position Uh, but before our interview i had a little extra time and so i just went out on my deck and laid in the noon sun you know and because i knew that would give me more energy for this call, because at that time there's, you know, like 40% of the, the rays are, are that infrared that I'd be getting by laying out there. And I have a red light panel that I use on the days when it's not beautiful, bright and sunny. Um, because I know this, I have this understanding of when that light hits my body and strikes the water, it does expand, it does grow. And it's like this, this battery in your body, you, you recharge. So you're talking about the breathitarians, you know, the people that, that just live on breath, but they are connected to, I would assume they're connected to light um, and also to the earth to get that negative charge from the earth as well. And, and they don't necessarily need as much food as someone that'd be stuck in an office building all day and surrounded by Wi-Fi and those types of things, would you say? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah ab- ab- absolutely. I mean, infrared is is all around us. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you you people don't don't realize that they think that oh, you know, if you turn on the electric oven and look at the glowing coils, yeah, they're generating heat and 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 that light that's coming out, that's infrared light. That's the general presumption. Uh, but in fact, everything is generating infrared light in the way. The way you can d- demonstrate that is is by having a camera with an infrared sensor instead of a visible light sensor. Mm. Um, and e- even if you you're in complete darkness, you can't see anything with your eyes or with a your cell phone camera if you happen to have one. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> if you have an infrared camera, you get a beautiful image of everything. So even if it were pitch black pitch dark at night and you're sitting outside where you're I guess sitting right now mm-hmm. uh, I'd be able to see um, with an infrared camera everything the the window frame the window the the um, side of your house the bench your hair whatever wow. so um, it's all around us all the time and therefore because it's all around us it's feeding us with infrared energy and the infrared energy is 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 building easy water and so the, the source of energy for buildup is all around us. It's also occurring inside your body because your metabolism is generating heat. Um, and the heat, again, is, is essentially similar to infrared. So you're, you are, are getting infrared uh, not only from outside mm-hmm. in the environment, but also from inside. So you've got uh, plenty of infrared energy um, uh, um, um, to, to build easy water throughout your body. 
And a you know extreme example of that is is the sauna or as the mm -hmm. Finns say a sauna. <laughs> um, you know what is the, what is the sauna? It's heat. Yeah, mm -hmm. sometimes sometimes dry heat and other times moist heat, but it's heat and and it's filled with infrared energy. So um, by sitting in the sauna, especially taking off your, your clothing, mm -hmm. you're exposed to all of these infrared uh, wavelengths, some of which penetrate deeply in your body, others not so deeply. And, and, and what that should do is build easy water. And, and, and since you need easy water for the proper function, as I was describing for each of your cells, um, if you don't have it, then your cells are dysfunctional. And if, you, if, if you're in really short supply, then the cells are pathological, as for example, in cancer cells. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so uh, sitting there, you know, if you, if you walk in feeling depressed and uh, with muscle pains, 20 minutes later, you walk out and it, as often as not, the pains are gone and you're feeling um, cheerful. Um, the depression has just uh, basically vanished. And it works, and and yeah. and so this is this is one of the simple expedients um, for health, and I think the for good health, and and I think the basis is very simple. Um, uh, infrared energy builds EZ in your cells, and your cells are functioning better. It's perhaps as simple as that. Yeah. yeah, and and cold therapy also, like cold plunging, is that another way that we can build EZ as well? I think so, and 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 the the reason is. Um, it stems from what I was describing a moment ago that your metabolism is generating heat and infrared mm -hmm. energy. So what happens is if you surround yourself with cold, then the infrared energy goes from the warmth of your core to the outside cold. It's, it's analogous to what happens uh, on a, a clear night uh, on, on, on the earth. You know, the, the warmth, the infrared energy is, is released to to um to the stratosphere to the beyond to the, to the universe to the cold that's that's out there um and and the same thing same principle applies in your body the your your core is is now the energy coming from your core is released to the ice outside mm -hmm. it's cold outside warm warm here and that passes through your body the infrared energy is passing through all the cells in your in your body and therefore conferring energy to those cells, building easy water. So I think that's the explanation for why immersing yourself in the cold, if you're, if you're up to doing that, I, <laughs> I'm not, but uh, you know, some are, uh, I, I think that's the reason why it's so effective. Yeah, I did, you know, that was a lot of my audience knows. So part of my uh, pregnancy prep was I cold plunged you know, three times a week. And oh, yeah, I was, I was, I wanted this baby. And one of my uh, health coaches slash uh, someone I study under, he said, you have to get cold. You have to do some cold plunging. That's going to help your mitochondria. That's going to uh, help regenerate eggs. It's going to make healthy mitochondria. And I said, okay, I'll do it. And uh, the, the craziest thing about it was as long as I immersed up to the neck, you know, sitting in I got the coldest I did was about 32 degrees, but I would get in there and go all the way up to the neck. And after, you know, maybe 60, 90 seconds, I would, I was warm as long as I didn't do a ton of moving around. If I was just still, and I was very careful right. with my breathing, my body felt really warm. The hardest part of cold plunge is getting in and then getting out because you feel your your body does create and generate all of this heat and so um yeah that's I, a lot of people talk about sauna which i i love sauna i've been missing it <laughs> but but the cold is just it's another fascinating way that our bodies can can create this heat as well well that's so interesting yeah um, yeah i've heard so much about it i haven't tried it myself yeah. and i'm not sure i will but <laughs> well, good for you <laughs> yeah <laughs> and and what about uh like grounding or earthing a lot of people think that that's kind of a a woo woo thing to do is walk around your yard barefoot or try to be out in nature and 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 connect to the earth how does that affect that easy water well here's what i think um there are lots of theories i've spoken to um enough enough people who have benefited from it that mm -hmm. i 
I'm convinced that that there is something something to it. And and so what is that? Uh, as I said, many many people, many theories, lots of biophysics going on. And I think um, uh, let me explain what I think. I think that it, it derives from connecting electrically uh, to the negative charge of the Earth. Mm -hmm. Now, many people don't know about the negative charge of the earth. I didn't know about it until 15 years ago when a, a, a Russian came uh, to my laboratory and spent a few months uh, working. And just on his departure, he was talking to me about the negative charge of the earth and the earth's electric field. And I said, I never heard of such a thing. And I hadn't. I studied, I started my education um, studying electrical engineering. And you know, I never heard about the negative charge of the Earth. We we were taught uh, that when you when you plug into the receptacle on the wall, that third prong is connected to ground or zero electrical potential. No no professor ever told me otherwise. And so for for so much of my academic life, I was convinced. Uh, uh, nobody even talked about it. Uh, there was just an assumption that the Earth must be neutral. And this Russian guy was telling me that, no, no, <laughs> the earth is negatively charged. And he said, every middle school student in Russia knows about that. He said, wow. you never heard about it? <laughs> I said, no, I never heard. He said, well, there's something that's deficient in the American educational system. Agree. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. I, I, I would agree with that too. No, Nobody thought it was important enough to describe. However, however <clears throat> I was... I became convinced when the next morning someone shows up with, with the famous uh, Feynman lectures, uh, lectures from the Nobel laureate Richard Feynman, three volumes, and he opens to volume two, chapter nine, and there it was uh, about the electrical, um, the negative electrical charge of the earth. The earth is filled with negative charge, and he presents the evidence for it. And there's lots of evidence for it. It's just mm -hmm. that we never hear about it. Um, <laughs> lots no. of phenomena for, for which there's a lot of evidence, but we just don't hear. So that convinced me. And how? why is that important? Uh, um, well, for, for, for many aspects of nature, but, but for the discussion at hand, um, it's important because if you connect yourself electrically to the earth, you're connecting yourself to a vast repository of negative charge. So what does that negative charge do? Well, if you've got some cells that don't have enough negative charge, that is, they don't have enough easy water, which is mm -hmm. negatively charged, those negative charges will seep into those cells. And what they'll do is build easy water. We know that because in the laboratory, we took, we did experiments. We uh, took a beaker of water. We stuck two electrodes in, passed current, and right around the negative electrode, um, easy water began to grow simply by mm. passing electrons into the water. Um, wow. The water converted into easy, easy water. And, and so, so the bottom line is that by connecting yourself electrically to the earth, we would presume that something similar uh, will will happen, and your cells will build easy water. So, so I think that's the mechanism. Uh, although there there are many ideas and many possibilities, but for me, this is a simple explanation of why it works and why it's beyond woo woo uh, to walk barefoot on the grass or even to hug a tree. Yes, um, there's something going on there. There's a transfer of negative charge and a buildup of easy water. That's why you feel better. Yeah, uh, I mean, there's, and we kind of talked a little bit before we turned the camera on, you were talking a little bit about um, just magnets in general. And uh, I'd be curious to know what, you, what you've what you learned about. Uh, oh, easy. oh, yeah. Well, thank you for being so, <laughs> so responsive. We just published a, um, a couple of papers. The first um, is if you stick a magnet in water, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it turns out that next to the North Pole and next to the South Pole, easy builds. Ah. It was a surprise. Uh, well, it wasn't exactly a surprise. I, I had an idea that something like that might happen, and I, I convinced the, the fellow working in the lab to explore that, and sure enough, uh, he, he found it. A second thing, which maybe is not related to water, but it, it, it's something I think we need to think about um, you know, nobody really understands how magnets work. Um, right. I'm, 
I'm not the first person to, to suggest that. Uh, many people are really confused about, uh, so what's going on inside of a magnet? You know, magnets have been known uh, from since the ancient Chinese found that if you put floated a magnet on water, it would point in one consistent direction. Uh, yeah, but, but what's going on? And nobody understands. But here's something that few people have, have thought about, and that is the consistency of a magnetic force. So, so you take a magnet and you lift a weight, um, and the magnet is therefore doing work because if you think about it, if you are replacing the magnet and you lift the same work, uh, same weight, you're doing work. And so the magnet is doing work. Now work needs energy, right? You can't right. do work without. So where does the energy come from? Uh, now the magnet can do this again and again, right? It remains at full strength essentially forever. Hmm. But wait a second, <laughs> that doesn't make sense because if you, if you, even in your non-pregnant state, um, if you were to lift a weight, you know, the first one, no problem. The second one, well, by the time you get to the 50th one, you'd be out of energy, right? right. You need right. to take a break and maybe drink some water and have some food and take a rest and whatever, and you could lift again. So the question is, where does the magnet get its energy? It seems to have infinite potential energy, but that's impossible at least as we understand uh, physics. So this is a question that has not been answered and uh, it needs to be answered. And um, I, I've been thinking about this, this issue. It's, uh, it, it's beyond water, but um, it, it's, um, you know, it's one of those fundamental features that people have not addressed. Right. And uh, the presumption is it comes from somewhere in the environment uh, because because you know, as soon as the magnet is lifted, it can lift the next weight with equal strength, equal ability. So it must be replenished in 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 some way, and um, and 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 therefore it must be some aspect unknown, uh, some aspect of the environment that's there all the time. It's a matter a matter to research it and figure out where where it's coming from. Absolutely. And of course, just just to circle back again to the point I I was making, you no. Know, Lots of people have reported that magnets are good for health. You know, mm -hmm. people often wear magnets or apply magnets, and uh, you know, and and I mentioned the first finding that magnets can build easy water. So if you put a magnet beside your body, <coughs> it's possible that the magnet will build easy water in the region of your body closest to the magnet, and that buildup can improve health. So. Possibly, we haven't researched this, but mm. hypothetically, at least, that could be the mechanism of positive action of magnets. Interesting. Have you heard of Dr. Bonley and the uh, Magnetico sleep pad? I've not. No, that's Please it's he, it's very interesting. They've done a lot of studies on just magnetism in general. Um, and so, yeah, they have like a, a pad that you can buy. It's pretty expensive. I have one for my my daughter because she's got a lot of health stuff and uh she she loves it she says she's never slept better i mean she she never slept deeper she yeah she used to have a lot of sleep issues but it's amazing and it's uh yeah it's a magnetico sleep pad and he's basically done a ton of research on uh health and magnetism and it kind of just mimics the earth's magnetic field he has it set up in a way it's not just like going out and buying just regular magnets he has it built in such a way that it mimics the earth's magnetic field so it's a little oh, more intelligent than just magnets yeah yeah uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, if if you when the interview is over if you wouldn't mind sending me a link or something I'd absolutely i would love to yeah yeah absolutely yeah so we've got uh you know infrared we have uh grounding what about drinking structured water um how do, does that help with this easy water inside the body or is it like the last thing on the list no it's not the last thing on the list it's the first thing on the list oh, um, okay I, I would say or <laughs> it's high up on the list so you know in order to build uh, the natural way of building structured water easy water four phase water is to drink water Right, mm -hmm. it's what I need to do more of. Um, yeah. 
you got to drink. So what happens? Well, you drink the water, and some of the water is converted into easy water, and it's converted because the the water will uh, eventually sit next to hydrophilic surfaces and be exposed to infrared energy coming from the core of of your body and and from outside. And so, in that way, your cells get well. I guess I would say hydrated is really mm -hmm. what what happens. That is hydration, uh, mm -hmm. the, the peeling of the cell with easy water is 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 hydration um, so you get it from water now um you can short circuit the process somewhat by drinking uh structure or easy easy water and that way you bypass uh, uh, the the necessary step of of converting the water into easy water it's there to start with uh -huh. now a few people have suggested well it can't possibly work because because the easy water is negatively charged negatively charged corresponds to high pH um, and the stomach through which the water has to pass is low pH and so mm -hmm. so what would happen is that the stomach would quickly neutralize any of that water and as it's true that uh, first of all that the stomach has low pH but what's also true is that the volume of that water is really small so if you drink a substantial amount of water that contains EZ uh, the impact of the stomach acid could be could be minimal, and therefore uh, the stomach acid doesn't impair or destroy the easy water that you you might you might swallow. And also, we we did study the effect of pH, um, and um, it turns out that you know neutral pH is pH seven. It turns out that. If, if you um, expose that to um, uh, low pH or high pH, uh, from pH 5 uh, through 9, it has almost no effect. It, it, has to be, it has to be the pH to which that water is exposed needs to be very high or very low pH in order to have a, a, a re real impact. So, so I think the bottom line is that if you, if you take a substantial number of gulps uh, mm -hmm. of the stuff and and this water contains a fraction of easy water inside, the easy water should almost certainly pass through uh, unimpaired. And so, so okay. yeah, and so you're, you know, if you drink, a good way to do this is to go into your backyard and take freshly grown plants and take the leaves and, and squeeze out the water. And there are devices to actually do this huh. and drink it. It doesn't taste great, but, um, you know, if you... Uh, spike it with uh, some nice flavors like strawberry or something um, is good for health should be good for health and and various various health practitioners have reported um, at least anecdotally to me that it's it's wonderful that patients come no matter what their affliction they're told to drink um, this this um, kind of, of water and they come back a few months later and they're feeling better it, almost irrespective of what their issue had been so wow. it's a it's a um, useful expedient, basically drinking. So when you're drinking the, the water from the plant, you're you're drinking easy water because inside the plant cells, the plant cells are filled with easy water, especially freshly grown plants. Yes. Um, you know, which which have abundant easy water. They're healthy inside their cells. So you drink it. It restores, it replenishes any easy water that's missing from your cells. Interesting. Yeah. So there is, yes, because some people have said, oh, drinking structured water is a waste, but I've, that's a topic I've been diving into quite a bit. And, uh, you know, just talking about health in general, um, you know, how, what have you seen around uh, cancer cells and, and easy water? Do you, have you, have you seen? Well, um, you know, we haven't studied cancer cells. However, um, the, 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 there's something that really is, I think, I, I think relevant. And so let me back up a step. Um, the, the electrical potential of the cell, you know, if you stick an electrode into a cell, if you measure the potential difference between the inside and the outside, it's somewhere between 50 and 100 millivolts negative. So the cell is negative. Why? If you read the textbook, um, you'll learn from the textbook that this is a function of the pumps and channels in the cell membrane. Um, an odd thing is that um, if you stick the same electrode into a gel instead of a cell, where there are 
you know, no membranes and obviously no pumps, no channels, you get the same result. So it becomes a little difficult to argue that the reason for this negative uh, charge or negative electrical potential inside the cell has to do with pumps and channels, because then you need a different explanation for the gels and for the cells. And I, are, I have argued and published papers and, and books and so that, um, that, that the electrical potential, the negative electrical potential arises from the easy water because the easy water is negatively charged. So if you have a cell that's filled with something that's negatively charged, namely the water, of course, you stick an electrode and you measure a negative electrical potential. Okay, so, and, and cells that are really healthy will give you um, a, a, a big, neg a large amount of negativity, okay? Mm. You know, okay. minus 70, minus 80 millivolts. And cells that have less easy water will give you, might give you 50 or 40 millivolts. Cancer cells give you 10 millivolts or 15 millivolts. Really? Yeah. Old, wow. old, old studies. What does that mean? Well, the way I would interpret that is those cells are missing a, a good deal of easy water. Um, okay. And in fact, the cells are rather undifferentiated, uh, mostly a lot of cytoplasm and lacking in, in distinct organelles. So it, it makes sense that, that much of the water inside the cell is just liquid water and not much easy water inside those cells. So what's the consequence of that? Well, the consequence is that if the cell contains mostly liquid water, if you remember, I was arguing earlier that when the cell is activated, uh, the water uh, transitions from easy water to ordinary liquid water. So the cancer cells don't have much easy. They have a lot of liquid water. And it's as though the cells are turned on. And turning on the cells, I mean, you know, if, if I'm the mitotic apparatus and, and the cell is activated, I'm going to do my work and start dividing. Uh, um, that's what's necessary to turn on the mitotic apparatus. And so the cell will keep dividing. And so what I'm getting at is, 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 is that a plausible approach to the issue of cancer and what's going on there, um, as opposed from to the genetic approach, which almost everybody is pursuing, yeah. is, is, is to look at the cell and find out what really is, is going on. And one, one feature of the cancer cell seems to be that the cancer cell is grossly lacking in easy water, and wow. explaining the very small negative electrical potential. It's a route that nobody has pursued, as far as I know, and I think it's um, it's a route that should be pursued because uh, I think it has it has great potential. Wow. Maybe a long answer to your short question. No, I love it because it just opens my mind into thinking about so many other health conditions that people have and wondering, you know what's the electrical potential of just this person's body you know what kind of voltage does their body have in general if they're str you know struggling with autoimmune disease hormonal imbalance uh just so many common things that uh, people in our society there's so many epidemics now um yeah. there's a fertility epidemic diabetes epidemic cancer you know cancer rates are like one in every two people now and so if we right. Yeah, wow. I had a cancer doctor on a, a couple of months ago, actually, and she was the one who encouraged me to read The Invisible Rainbow. That's why I wanted to bring her on, because we talked a lot about, you know, how she thinks that a lot of our devices are carcinogens, you know, and they're they're causing more cancer in the body. But when you look at it from your point of view, I mean, it's kind of the same thing, but we're, we're that that's a low voltage in the body. And think about all the things oh, well. that we're exposing our bodies to, which is essentially exposing the easy water in our bodies to, right? Right. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, the, um, the, the consequence of that, of what you're, what you're describing is that one way of, of preventing cancer is to make sure that your, your cells are filled with easy water. So uh, whatever expedients you can, you can think of to, to build that easy water should have an anti-cancer impact, um, you know, um, and and uh, um, so walking barefoot on the grass, for example, uh, uh, hugging trees, uh, mm -hmm. 
uh, taking a mud bath and connecting yourself to the earth and, and making sure that it, all, of, uh, all that you can do to build this kind of water in your cells that you're, you're, you're taking advantage. And conversely, all of those um, agents in our environment that destroy or impair water structure could be carcinogenic. Wow. Yeah. That's so fascinating. Yeah. And, you know, I know it's kind of a different topic, but you've done some study on uh, water and, and consciousness, right? And and everyone knows about Emoto and, and kind of throws that around, but what you're doing is a little bit different, correct? Well, yeah, um, it, it, it's, uh, we, we started experiments. We had no results yet. We just did preliminary experiments and um, we had a, we we had a glass of uh, water just like this um, in a in a beaker, sitting in the laboratory, and we invited um, a bunch of healers one at a time, and healers would come into the room and 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 do whatever they would would do to the water, in, impart their their energy, their healing energy, and um, and the idea is to examine the water before and after. We have five different uh, methods. Uh, to measure the physical chemical aspects of uh, of the water and um, the experiments were preliminary and and so they were actually done to figure out um, uh, to refine the experimental protocol so I can't say that we have any results uh, to begin with but we're now about to to um, to begin some serious experiments based on what we've learned previously and that's going to begin pretty soon we we actually in fact got some funding to to pursue oh, this. Oh wow! Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. We'll see. Uh, we're we're optimistic that we we might find something, <laughs> but we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, there are a, a lot of the a lot of the people who engage in healing seem to think that the water is somehow that that that. Um, one recipient of their energy could well be the water. Mm -hmm. um, and so it would be nice to, um, um, I mean, because this energy, we we really don't understand um, what's the nature of this energy. It's kind of analogous to uh, maybe 200 years ago, 250 years ago, where nobody understood about electrical energy. You know, right. what's, what's the nature of, of this kind of energy? Now we know, or at least we think we know, <laughs> um, you know, and 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 I think the subtle energy that is associated with consciousness is in an analogous uh, a position. We don't know, and we don't even know how how to ask the right questions. So it's at a very primitive state, and we hope to shed some light on it. We'll see. A very important important topic, and many of coming are coming to realize that. The issue of consciousness is equally important, and some argue even more than the, the physical kinds kinds of um, understanding that we have stemming from Newton and people people like that. Scientists have largely ignored the subtle energies and consciousness that may turn out to be really important. Um, we'll see. I agree. I agree. Yeah. There, you know, a lot of people want to do the whole water structuring thing and maybe they, they can't afford a, a device. And I'm like, just put your water out in the sunlight and say a blessing, you know, it, it, get, give your water some intention. And I think that that can be a very powerful tool in, in improving the quality of your water as well. It it can, but but you know, um, there's a lot of skepticism, and mm -hmm. and what's necessary um, are scientific experiments done yeah. done properly with with uh, reproducible um, results and and conclusions, and that's what we're trying to do. There there are in in fact so many experiments out there. So each year, each year we we run the. Uh, the conference on the physics, chemistry, and biology of water, and inevitably someone comes and and presents evidence about um, uh, that these subtle energies um, really have an ha have an impact, and and perhaps the most you might say distinguished of all, all of those people were, was um, the late Luc Montagnier, um, mm. who won a Nobel Prize for identifying HIV, and he went on to study water and. And what he found is that um, that DNA uh, could impart 
it's sequence information to water um you know and wow and and, and the experiment uh, uh, you know he took a he took a dna strand a short strand of 100 or so base pairs with a certain sequence and he demonstrated using the pcr technique that's used now to check for uh, covid um same technique and he found that um <laughs> that he could transmit this, info, or the, sorry, the DNA, or the water surrounding the DNA could transmit this information to a flask of water that was sitting nearby, sealed flask of water, no, no chemical communication, but something, some subtle energy. He presumed it was electromagnetic energy, but you know, nobody knows exactly. Uh, and and the, the experiments worked. And, and these experiments are widely doubted among scientists, because it seems, it seems, um, it seems a reach to to even imagine how this could happen, how it could work, but it seems to work, and it's been confirmed now in three different laboratories, in two Italian labs, and and one Chinese lab, you know. And if we take confirmation as evidence for for truth, it seems to be true, um, mm -hmm. you know, and and. Um, well, uh, if it's true, it's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, so this is just I'm giving this is just one example of the uh, of the kind of subtle energy that that seems to be in evidence and uh, beyond the woo woo uh, sort of thing. So there are many such demonstrations um, uh, using different approaches and different experimental models that seem to imply that there is this kind of energy. Um, you know, if you stand back as an objective observer, you need to take them seriously because many of these experiments were done properly and um, with with conclusions that, well, all I can say is um, uh, there, there have been so many of them now that um, it, it, they really need to be, um, uh, I mean, the entire field need, needs to to um, receive a lot more attention um, and seriously than it, it's been receiving. So many mainstream scientists uh, just simply dismiss it because yeah. it doesn't make sense. However, a lot of things don't make sense until you really understand them. That's so true. Yeah. 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 And and uh, you've got a couple of new books. You said two new books coming out. I have two and new books and I've been waiting for my son, the artist uh, who's been busy with his home remodel and uh, he's starting to ramp up again to finish the artwork for the two books and ah. the first one the first one deals deals with the role the unrecognized role of electrical charge in nature and and, and of course it starts with water but it goes well well beyond uh, water so there are many phenomena in nature that we just take for granted and we, however if you if you take the accepted argument point of view uh, and and ask start penetrating more deeply and ask the next set of questions that um, go beyond the superficial you run into obstacles for example just gravitation so mm. so um you know if you if you ask the uh, typical non-physicist they'll say, oh yeah, well, gravitation, yeah, two masses and the masses attract. You've got a bigger mass, you've got a stronger gravitational force. But the next question is why? Why do masses attract, right? And, and you know, if you ask that to a physicist, either they act in a way that's dumbfounded or they'll say, oh, well, it has to do with Einstein's uh, curvature of space-time, whatever that means, mm -hmm. um, yeah and and you don't really get anywhere so you have to ask um you know is is our fundamental understanding correct or is there something is is there something else that better explains it um uh, without without these sorts of questions that seem virtually unanswerable another uh and and, and so there are many many of these for example what i deal with in the book is what turns the earth mm. Right, every twenty-four yeah. hours, it seems. Uh, and but yeah. what what's what's Who's doing that? Yeah, yeah, and people don't really give that a whole lot of thought. No. <laughs> um, uh, what about weather? Um, 
you know, mm -hmm. uh, clouds are made of water. Uh, if you if you climb a ladder to the level of clouds with a pitcher of water and turn the pitcher over, the water comes splashing down on our heads, right? But the cloud stays up there. Sometimes, <laughs> other times, it rains. Right. And what you know? What keeps the cloud up there? What's responsible for turning on the rain? And how come the rain occurs in droplets instead of you know Just bathtub a ba yeah <laughs> overturn et cetera et cetera and and another one is is birds so if I were to yes. ask you, if I were to ask you well how do birds fly um, you know your your progeny uh, coming uh, when he or she um, uh, reaches age eight or nine you know the question might come hey mom how do birds fly. And your response would probably be, um, well, they flap their wings. Yes. Right? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, and your astute child will look up at, at an eagle's nest, which is right nearby. There is one right where, near where I'm sitting right now at my home. Um, look at the eagle's nest and see that the eagles, they may flap their wings occasionally, but mostly they don't flap their wings. Right. And, they can fly, they can fly level, they can fly down, and they can even fly up. They can fly into the wind, at right angles to the wind, uh, with the wind, and they don't flap their wings. So what's going on? <laughs> so this is a question that needs to be answered. And the, the usual response is, well, they catch updrafts. Um, well, if they catch updrafts, um, if there are updrafts, then there must be downdrafts. Otherwise, we'd lose our atmosphere. We can't breathe, right? right? So, right. so if the eagle happened to run into a downdraft, um, it would go plunging down, um, right? Just like a glider plane, which can stay up for, uh, you know, without any power or whatever. So something else is going on. And, and, and what's going on? Um, you got to ask that question, um, and if you if you somehow invoke invoke uh, Bernoulli's principle, a curvature of the wing, it doesn't quite do it. Um, it doesn't explain why it moves forward. Uh, it may explain mm -hmm. lift, but then again, it doesn't even explain that because planes can fly upside down, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. so, yeah. if it has to do with the wing cross sectional shape, uh, then planes shouldn't be able to fly upside down, et cetera, right. et cetera. So. So these are, and it, it turns out that all of the issues that I've I, I, I've mentioned, the role of electrical charge I think is dominant, although nobody mm -hmm. nobody has come to realize it. And that's that's the theme of the book. And and uh, just waiting for my son, who's finally gearing up to finish the the artwork and the cover, et cetera, et cetera. And there's another book that's also almost done, and it has to do. It has to do with the structure of the atom. Mm. Um, so we've all learned, you know, in what middle school or high right. school, or whatever. Um, atom consists of a nucleus and electrons, and now we understand it's electron clouds instead of mm -hmm. electrons. But but essentially the same. And you know, despite the uh, plethora of subatomic particles which is a bit disturbing. In order to make the model work, you have to keep adding. There are now some, I think, 50 or 60 subatomic particles that seem necessary. Usually a good model is a, a model that doesn't need extra added parts to, to make it fit the evidence, right? Uh, usually right. it's the opposite. Um, it explains a lot more than you, you might think and, um, initially. So, so here are a few questions. <laughs> Uh, that you, you start with. So the nucleus contains, in theory, um, it contains protons and neutrons. Neutrons mm -hmm. are neutral. Protons are positive. All of those protons are stuck together tightly. Now, I learned in middle school that when you put positive charges together, they repel. Mm -hmm. And you learn the same thing. Mm -hmm. So the question is, if all of those positive charges are stuck together, why doesn't the nucleus explode? <laughs> okay, so the <laughs> physicists did think about this uh, this issue, and they came up with a solution. And the solution is quote the strong force. So what's the strong force? The strong force is a force that someone conceived in order to do what's necessary 
to hold the nucleus together so it doesn't explode. It has all the right features. Mm -hmm. But there's no independent evidence for the existence of such a force. It's like it's like a Band-Aid um, uh, designed to cover a gaping wound, right? Because wow. you can't find independent evidence. It's got to be there because the model has got to be right. And therefore, you have to solve the problem. That's not the only problem. Um, no. No, because the electrons have negative charge. So uh, mm. now I learned in, in middle school, I think, that when you have plus and minus, they attract each other. Right. So the question is, how come all those negative electrons or electron clouds don't coalesce onto the positive nucleus, collapsing the atom into nothingness? It's a question mm. you never thought of, right? No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think most people have. <laughs> I don't think most, but it's a problem. It's a fundamental yeah, problem, right? It is. The yeah. atom, as, as it's formulated, the atom is unstable. Mm -hmm. And therefore, since atoms are stable, um, you know, you can't have an, uh, you can't have a theory that, that predicts instability. Mm -mm. All right, so something is wrong with the theory. And uh, yes. so I, I'm, I'm just in, in the book, I describe that, uh, that problem and more problems. And, and I'm suggesting um, uh, another model, with, which um, I, I think better explains the evidence. Interesting. Um, yeah, so that's the second book. And, uh, you know, you, as you can imagine, I'm really excited about the material in both books. And I'm hoping for publication of the first one, maybe in six months or so, and the second one, maybe six months after that. Wow. They're both close to completion. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm having lots of fun. Yeah. yeah. And and just kind of uh, to wrap up, what's going on with your lab? I know uh, Dr. Clinton, Dr. Catherine Clinton, she's a friend of mine. She was doing some live streams and a little bit of fundraising uh, for your lab. How is all of that going? Well, thanks for asking. Um, you know, uh, we had for quite a few years we 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 had a um, a benefactor, uh, mm -hmm. a, a wealthy man who, um, who 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 promised to to fund us indefinitely uh, mm -hmm. and amply um, unless he ran into some unexpected financial problem. Well, he ran into an unexpected financial <laughs> problem. Um, his money is tied up in assets, and it's difficult for him to sell the assets to get cash, which is needed for for the funding of our laboratory. So suddenly, we were, were without funding. We did manage to get some funding um, mm. from a, a foundation, actually, to support the studies on um, consciousness and mm -hmm. healers and such. But but that's not enough to um, to run a, a laboratory that has a you might say um, uh, that that has a critical mass of people. And mm -hmm. my experience, the critical mass is needed because, you know, you have one person who knows physics, another person knows chemistry and biology, and they interact with one another. And the progress is so much greater when you have that diversity of, uh, of inputs. And there are so many issues that need to be tackled. So so we are looking for, uh, for, for funding. And okay. You know, if anybody um, has done well and is is looking for an, an opportunity to donate, uh, we would please contact me. We would be delighted to hear from you. Thank you for asking. Uh, yeah, I, absolutely. I, I wanted to make sure to include that and I will have the information if someone does, who happens to be listening, want to support the lab, um, have a way to reach out and, and be able to support you in that way. Thank you. Thank you yeah. so much. You're so welcome. Well, thank you for spending so much time with me today. And I, you know, I'm sure we could continue on talking. For yeah, there's a lot to talk about. It's been fun. <laughs> thank you yeah. uh, very much, Sarah. And good thank luck you. with um, with your delivery. Um, yes. Uh, really <laughs> I'm trying to do a water birth. That's the goal. So. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Wow. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Wow. Good yeah. for you. Good yeah. for you. Yeah. So. Just that's wonderful. Um, well, thank you. Absolutely wonderful. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Um, and uh, perhaps one day we'll meet in person. <laughs> I hope so. Well, thank yeah. you. Okay, my pleasure.